This is a CNA podcast. Doors are closing. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to this episode of Work It. We love our acronyms in Singapore. Recently, a new one was added. JSIT. J-S-I-T. Do you know what it means, Adrian? Since this is a work-related podcast, I would guess it means job satisfaction is terrible. <laughs> Wrong answer. <laughs> but I think it may have more to do with our topic today. So, job skills integrator. Yeah. This was a thing that was announced during Budget 2023. JSIT will be an important part of Singapore's training and placement ecosystem. So, they're somewhat like job matchmakers in a way. They know the industry, they know what's skills are required and they will look for the people who can fit specific roles. I'm guessing the key point of this is to make things easier for everyone. A coordinator who takes a lot of the chaos out of a sprawling system. And we do have a sprawling system. We've talked about it before, especially with skills future, training and all kinds of things. So today we have Jeremy Fox, who is a regional CEO of Generation, an NGO that provides something of a matching service. Jeremy has a very long and impressive CV. He worked at McKinsey. <laughs> for a decade. He got his PhD when he was 24. What were you doing at 24? <laughs> Definitely not getting my PhD. <laughs> <laughs> he has a background in neurobiology and he's a certified professional coach. Yes? Yes. Phew. Okay. Phew. Kind of. A very impressive Tinder profile, I would say. <laughs> uh, so Jeremy has been doing the work of JSIT long before we came to know of its existence and is here to chat with us today. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks for having me. So let's start by giving a listeners a sense of what exactly you're doing right now with Generation. We understand you already performed the role of a JSIT. Maybe you can explain a bit more on that. Yeah, it is very much like a JSIT. We came to Singapore five years ago and we've been working with SSG, IMDA, WSG for quite a while. I'd like to think that we've uh, inspired this new trend of the <laughs> JSITs. We basically do exactly what you're saying, kind of all in one. We're an NGO. It's a not-for-profit. It's uh, We have charity status in every country that we're in. We have 17 countries now. We're actually still quite young. We're only about seven years old, but we've been growing a lot recently. Right. We try to find individuals who are struggling to get into good employment, good entry-level career-building jobs for whatever reason. You could be lower income, lower educational attainment, retrenched, you don't have the skills to fit the new jobs of the market. Anyone who's really motivated to get into a full-time job but is proven to be unable to do so, we will bring into our programs. And it can be all ages. So we actually started as a youth organization mm -hmm. to help youth, mm -hmm. and now we've really moved into all ages. And actually, Singapore was the first market that we started to do mid-career. Oh. Another pioneering uh, moment for Singapore. We identify individuals and then we go to market. So one of our distinctive value propositions is we're very good about talking to the market, talking to industry, finding employers, and working with them to identify exactly the roles that they need mm. to fill and the skills that they need to fill those roles. We actually do what we call activity mapping. We'll literally go in, shadow people on the roles, right. figure out what they do, and try to identify the things that make someone most successful in the role. And it's not always the technical skills. The technical skills are actually kind of easy to figure out. It's a yeah. lot of times the softer skills. It's communication skills, working in teams, customer service in some cases. There's lots of different things that go into making someone successful that's beyond the technical skills. And then we build boot camps, anywhere from six to 12 week boot camp, very intensive, full time, train people on the technical skills, behaviors, mindsets. It's very experiential. We're trying to give them the experience of working in the job. Mm. So when they land on the job, they are really job ready because they know how to work in the job. They didn't just right. get the technical skills that you would get in school. Mm. We also do career coaching, career counseling. We help them articulate their value proposition so they can take themselves to market. And then we give them wraparound support. We definitely have found out that people need more than just the classroom training and the placement into jobs. So we have mentors, we have coaches, can be technical coaches, social support services sometimes. We have a lot of people who have caregiving roles uh, who are struggling mental health issues. Yep. 
that wraparound is critical for keeping people in the program. And also that continues for us for three to six months on the job. Mm. So we want to make sure that once they're on the job, that they're very sticky and they're retained. They're not left, right? Yeah, we spend a lot of time yeah. placement. It can take six months, sometimes more, but basically up to six months to place someone in a job, even with employers mm. that we've curated, because they still have to interview. Of they course. They still have to get through the interview. They have to get a technical interview sometimes. Yeah. And then they have to survive on the job. And if you're getting into a new job, especially in an industry you don't know anything about, or you didn't know anything about a few months ago, it's scary. It can be very intimidating. So having that extra wraparound support is critical right. to get people to stick in these jobs. I hope this doesn't sound very simplistic, but throughout my career, right, if I wanted to move into a job, I went to a job portal mm -hmm. or I asked someone, hey, is there an opening? And I sent in my resume mm -hmm. if I needed specific training. So, for example, as a journalist, we were sent for basic reporting course. Yep. When I moved to teaching, I was sent for an intense one-week course, etc. And the company took care of it, yep. basically, as long as they thought, okay, sounds like you can work here. I'll give you the training. Off we go. Things seem to have become a lot more complex. It is, yeah. There's a lot of noise out there, yeah. Well-intentioned noise. There's so I, much I mean, noise. I'm wondering what has changed. Why has it become so complicated to get a job? Something which you can do well, mm -hmm. you can have a decent career in it. Something has changed? Yeah, and for many people, they change job when the headhunter call. And those people doesn't seem to be struggling at all. So yeah. what has changed? Well, in a different classes and clear tiers of individuals. If you are fortunate like us to be able to have a headhunter find you and call you, you're going to be okay. I yeah. mean, that's what the markets are built for today. Right. It's sort of the top of the pyramid, right? Yeah. That part of the market will clear itself because mm. people have good understanding of what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And then that skill gap from where they are to where they want to go isn't that high. The market is built for that. The market is built on credentials, mm. your CV, experience, your past experience. Yep. And even if you're making a bit of a transition, if again, you're at the kind of top of the pyramid, it's still relatively easy to navigate that. Mm. Mm. What's very difficult is most people are not at the top of the pyramid. They didn't go to a good school. They don't know exactly what they want to do. Maybe they had some struggles when they were growing up and they don't even know where to start. Like mm. you don't know what a teaching job is like. They don't know what a digital marketing job looks like. They or just, a social media content creator. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They know concept really of what they are. Not that they couldn't do it or wouldn't like to do it, but even the awareness of mm. where to look to figure out what job I want. And then once you figure out what job you want, you need to back all the way up to where am I today? Mm. What skills do I need? Because nobody's going to tell you what skills you need. Where do I go to get those skills? What's the most efficient path? That's where it gets extremely complicated because it's a very long journey from wanting a good job, not knowing what it might be, not knowing what you might be good at, to actually getting into a good long-term job. Yeah, That path is fragmented. There's lots of players along the way. So you almost think someone who's navigating this for the first time has got to jump from one cliff to another mm. without having those bridges and those connections. Yeah, what I'm hearing is that not everybody's path is the same. If you are a headhunted person, then obviously your path is set. I wonder whether this goes back to education though, Jeremy. In Singapore, we always pick things we think would work and we study things that we mm. think will work. Business, for example, finance, for yeah. example. When they start working, maybe there's some existential <laughs> yeah, yeah. crisis yeah, about. Never, yeah. I think it's like that period of time when everyone was talking about oh everyone should join the biomed industry biotech oh, yeah. industry yeah. there were yeah. so many buildings being built in fact around this period yeah, right around here yeah. around this area <laughs> but then the whole thing just start to go down yeah and, and then we don't hear about it yeah. and then and yeah. now everything's tech everything is web developers and digital marketers so there's a couple of things what you pick to study early on is quite early and you don't really know if that is what you're going to be passionate about when you get out of school right, right. I mean, you're choosing what you want to do in school when you're in Singapore, very young, actually. <laughs> yes. A lot of times you come out and you realize this isn't exactly what I want. Either it's not the technical topic or it's just not the way I want to be working. Mm -hmm. um, so that definitely happens. The other big issue, of course, is the markets change very quickly. So you might get into something that you thought was interesting or going to be hot. And then when you get into the job market, it's just not there mm -hmm. or it's saturated and you can't do mm -hmm. much about it. We actually do have a lot of people who are coming out of higher education with uh, maybe a liberal arts degree or something that they can't get into employment and they need to reskill into something. And we have a lot of people are reskilling into technology mm. nowadays because of that. So even if you went to school and did something that you might have wanted to do, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have that good job when you come out. So and maybe because education takes so darn long, if you yeah. go in at year one, yeah. by the time you graduate in year four, 
the entire scene has already changed. Yeah, Whatever absolutely. you studied for may no longer be relevant. This is sort of the, one of the structural problems with the education system globally. It's two years to four years to get that education to go out to the market. But the curriculum that's built is 10 years old in a lot of cases, right? It is not responsive to the market. We spent a lot of time working with the polytechnics here. Great educational system, of course. Working with them, running programs with them, mm. and trying to teach them to go to market, to talk to employers, to use that information to come back to revise curriculum. Mm. You, we want to mm. have this kind of fast cycle of curriculum revision. And we do it in our programs. We run a first cohort. We immediately go and revise the curriculum. Oh, wow. After pretty much every cohort, we will have a look and make tweaks if we need to. Right. And then do pretty much a full curriculum revision almost every year because things just move so, so quickly. Mm, that's such a burden on the teachers, I have to say. It's incredibly oh. difficult and it's structural. They're not Built, built or organized for, yeah. or incentivized to go out and talk to companies, right? That's right. just not how academia works no. in any country. <laughs> yeah, and curriculum change can take so long. I'm sure you know, Christina. Yeah, 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 yeah. We used to take the three years to just move. It's like moving a big boulder. Yep. Bit big, by big bit, ship, you do it yeah, for three years. Steering the Titanic. Yeah. <laughs> and then you have to get clearance from like a hundred yep. people above you. Yep. It was not fun. And then last person would say no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the bureaucracy can be very challenging. Again, all very well-intentioned, but these are old institutions, right? So, yeah, of course. So from what I imagine, I would see that perhaps the mid-career people may require a bit more help because the younger generation, mm. well, I can always become a TikToker, survive on Instagram <laughs> for a few years gig, and see how it goes. Gig yeah, gig yeah. Work. yeah, a lot of gig work going on. You still need some skills to be able to do that. You need to be able to do graphic design or some digital marketing, social media content management. I mean, yeah, you need yeah. to learn to do something. Mid-careers are more of a challenge on the employment side. Because there's a lot of biases against mid-career workers. A lot of yes, biases I've been about somebody quite coming a bit in, of that. especially in technology. Again, a lot of, especially because of COVID, a lot of what we've been doing is a lot of healthcare and a lot of technology roles. And it's very difficult to bring someone in who's 45 or 50 who needs to be supervised by someone who's 25. Mm, it's difficult. Mm. Not that they don't have the skills to do it. We actually have a lot of good research to show that the reskilling does work and they can be very successful. And there's a lot of transferable skills, especially if you've been out in the market for a while, that you can bring to bear on the role. Those aren't really quantified very well. So when you're going out into the market, people aren't really able to categorize their role beyond the technical skills to say these are the types of, again, transferable skills, leadership skills, management skills, like communication, communication skills, skills, sales, right? That stuff isn't always top of mind, but yeah. it is critical for the roles. And people can be very successful. So what's the problem? It's just that people don't want to hire when they see someone on the resume already 50 and they're thinking, mm -hmm. mm, maybe this guy might take a long time to Yeah, take a long time to come up to speed. Maybe it won't fit with my organization. Won't be as malleable. <laughs> we'll be a bit more stubborn. All the kind of ingrained biases that we probably, frankly all have. And without the added lens of what are all the non-technical strengths they're going to bring to the role, mm -hmm. right, to counterbalance mm -hmm. that. To be fair, I know that there's a lot of bias, but I've met slightly older people who are resistant. Oh, it does happen. Yeah, <laughs> it definitely happens. <gasps> who I'm like, just trying to learn something new and they're like very resistant. Like, are you sure? I don't want to do this. It's too hard for me. I'm like, yeah. you have to try, right? Yeah, this is the way to do it. And that we, our research shows the same. The mid-career transitioners are least likely to want to get retrained, even though they do actually understand that they need the retraining. Yeah. So there, there's some... So there's a bit of both, right? There's the bias of that's for sure. I mean, you have to give someone a chance. But there's also these guys... Some of them yeah. who make it hard for everybody else. Yeah, this is part of sort of the soft skills. Hard to say it's training, but you know, within our boot camps, we focus very, very much on growth mindset, right? A learning orientation and growth mindset. Mm. And yeah, you have to unstick some people a bit more than others. Uh, not necessarily always <laughs> age, but age can be a confounding factor. But we really want to make sure that for all of our programs, people are coming out ready to continue to learn. That's mm. one of the biggest things because they are still boot camps, right? We're still training people in a month or three, right? So they haven't learned everything. But when sure. they get into the interview, especially, they need to be able to convey that I have a good base set of knowledge, but I'm ready to keep going. I'm ready to learn. Right. I'm ready to grow. Right. And even for a mid-career, we try to you got to reinforce that mm. as much as possible. And we try to select for it for the people coming to the programs. So from what we understand, JC, it's not just about doing desktop research or looking at online data, but it goes beyond. As an integrator, you need to have a deep knowledge of market demand, a deeper relationship with employees 
four years. And something that really triggers me is how does it differentiate from the existing support that is already out there? Because for the longest time, we have E2I, WSG. Yep. And mm-hmm. a few years back, mm-hmm. you have Maximus in just coming into the picture. And I used to work for one of them. So how would it be different from what was actually already being delivered and supporting at the ground? I think it is kind of in the name. I think it's the idea of integrating those different pieces. We're not technically adjacent ourselves, right? There's going to be the three for the pilots will be nominated. But they need to bring together those resources from the market. We just had a meeting with a friend at SSG yesterday. It isn't entirely defined yet how much an individual organization is going to try to do all the pieces, sort of like what we do end-to-end, versus pull players out of the market and integrate their Mm, activity. It's actually very difficult to do it all. And when we've tried to work with organizations like the Polytechnics, they've done incredibly well, but it's still difficult to get to that higher level, right? Right. So we get 88% placements out of our programs within six months. I mean, Mm. that's huge, like really, really high fidelity. It's difficult for any organization to be able to do that individually, but there's a lot of skill out in the market. There's a lot of uh, expertise in the market in different pieces of the journey that can be brought together. Now, how they're brought together, how you build a common incentive around those different players, how you get them to communicate with each other and do clean handoffs of an individual from one to the other is yet to be determined. The JSITs are going to have to figure out how to do that. Hey, everyone. My name's Stephen Chia, and I'm host of CNA's weekly news podcast, Heart of the Matter. Now, each week, my job is to ask questions you have, like, why is the COE so high? Why aren't singles dating? Or what is going on with the red-hot property market in Singapore? If you want the views behind the news, then tune in each week as we get to the heart of the matter. We are on the CNA and Me Listen apps and wherever you get your podcasts. Hit follow or subscribe so you don't miss an episode when it drops. I want to go back to something you mentioned. You did say that there is a skills gap, Mm -hmm. so to speak. We hear this a lot, actually. In Singapore, we hear this, especially on the back of automation, AI, tech skills. I think you're seeing that, right? The government keeps telling us, go for training, upskill, do your part, you're responsible for your own lunch. But I'm wondering whether employers, companies themselves Mm. have to be in the driver's seat. Let me just give you a simple example. So in a media company, you know AI is coming and one day it could write its own stories. You don't sit down and say, okay, let's see what happens then. You're now training already the people who have been doing this for 25 years, writing stories, to think about how AI is going to complement their work or whatever. So in other words, the company is front and center in protecting its people so that they don't become displaced. And then I have to go to someone and say, oh my God, help me. Mm. What do you think about that? Should we be doing more of that? We hope companies will be doing more of that because what you don't want to do is have, again, AI coming in to the fore and then just go to market to try to find people who can do it and then you end up having to turn over your own workers. Nobody wants that. It's not Mm. good for your incumbents. It's not good for your bottom line, quite frankly. But it is also a bit difficult, I think, for companies to figure out how to do it. Like Mm. cracking their own internal training, especially for newer technologies, is hard. And we do have actually a lot of companies that come to us and say, we have employees that we think are going to become obsolete or are going to become retrenched. Can you help us reskill them? Which isn't typically our mandate. We typically go for people who are not <laughs> yeah. employed. But if someone's imminently going to be unemployed, that's something that we would be happy to work on. Companies struggle too. That's a lot the of sense are large. They're yeah. bureaucratic. It's difficult to set up these programs in house. It's difficult to know who to go to market to, who's credible mm. to do the training, because you might do some training and it doesn't really stick. It might not have the mindsets and the behaviors. You know, there's a lot of reasons it is. It isn't as simple. And then a lot of the companies are SMEs. They're very, they're small. Mm. They can't do it themselves, right? We work with a lot of SMEs. They need to be able to go out to market and aggregate somewhere to retrain their staff. I think a lot of burden should be there, but we do find companies struggling quite a bit to be able to build these in-house. And for any client that actually go through your program, can you walk us through a timetable of how it's like from the day they onboard to hopefully the day they very much, very quickly get into the employment scene? We do outreach in a couple of ways. One, obviously, just typical 
digital marketing, social media. We try to get people sign up as much as possible through those channels. But because of the beneficiaries we have, we also a lot of times go through social organizations, other NGOs, Daughters of Tomorrow, those types of groups to try to find the beneficiary groups that we want. And sometimes we're very targeted. Sometimes we specifically are trying to do women in technology Mm. or we're trying to do Aboriginal populations, right, that struggle typically to get into a lot of the traditional roles. Mm. And we do targeted outreach for them. We will screen through applicants, can get those in who are really highly motivated. Again, our screening process isn't as much about do they have any incoming skills? It's about the motivation. Mm. Are they ready to do it? Sign them up for a program. Maybe the program starts in a month. Some of the healthcare programs can be as short as six weeks. Tech programs are up to three months. So you do that training. And then it's a anywhere from immediately placed in a job because once you graduate, we always have the employers involved anyway. But as soon as you graduate, we'll have an event. We'll have the employers in. We'll do matchmaking ourselves. We'll do curate interviews and try to get people matched straight away. Mm. So you might be matched a week or two after graduating. Some people actually find their own jobs before they graduate, which is great. Um, Or it could take up to six months of us working with them and them interviewing to get into a job. Mm -hmm. So the whole time frame can be up to nine months at the longest, but we're trying to do it as quickly as possible Mm -hmm. because the longer someone is out of a job, Mm -hmm. the worse it is for them. So we try not to waste any time. We try to do it as efficiently as we possibly can. It can be as short as three months. And the key thing they have to bring to the table is just a lot of motivation. 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 If you're going to go into a, a nursing support role, we want to see that you have empathy. You know, we want to see that you're going to be comfortable <laughs> in, a, in a hospital environment. I think our, our very first hospital program we ran was in India. And we uh, recruited a cohort of uh, 30 people or so, accepted them into the program, then took them to the hospital. Half of them fainted. <laughs> you know, we realized, okay, wait, we should probably take them to the hospital before we accept them to the yeah, program. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you have to have kind of the right intrinsics for the role. I mean, you're going to do a technical role. You have to at least be able to upload your CV, do a very basic online task. So then there's a little bit of technical competence there. We try to keep the bar extremely low. We, we really mm, want mm. to be able to train people who have no background at all to be able to get into and start these roles. Sounds great. So one of the things that has come up and people have been commenting on this Mm -hmm. is that what are the outcomes and how do we measure them, Mm -hmm. right? Because there is a tendency, especially when it's a government policy scheme or whatever, to just make it look like, okay, it worked because I matched this 100 jobs or 100 people or whatever. What do you think is a good outcome for you in your experience, right? Having placed all these people, trained somebody who has no training, what is a good outcome to you? Ours is actually quite simple because ours is, it's employment. We have breadth, depth, and durability. So how many people can we serve and get into jobs? How good are those jobs? What's the quality? What's the income uplift? And then how long... Do they continue to work in those jobs? So those are the three things you want to look at. Just the most basic thing is if you ran a program, what percentage are getting into the jobs? Mm. Full stop, right? If you have 20% of your people coming out and getting into jobs, you're probably not doing very well. Mm. If you have 80%, you're doing fantastic, right? Mm. Because a typical training program that isn't very strongly placement focused or they don't have the placement skills might be in that 20 to 40% range. So it's relatively low. You want to make sure the jobs are good. You want to make sure that people are happy. So we do alumni surveys, satisfaction surveys to understand what the income uplift is, what their personal well-being is, family situation everything. So we want to make sure that they are happy and healthy once they're in the role Mm. and then that they stick and that they're there in a career longer term. We ask them, you know, have you been promoted? Kind of what the career growth has been. We really want this to be career building. And when it's career building for an individual, the whole generation, it changes the individual, their family, it changes their children. I mean, it Mm -hmm. puts someone on a completely different path from where they were before. Right. And you have to have that durability for that to happen. Basically, it breaks them out of that cycle. Cycle, uh? absolutely. It's, right? yeah. That's the whole idea. Yeah. It's economic uplift, economic mobility. Absolutely. Okay, so what I'm hearing is it cannot be a short-term numbers game. No, it, it can't. But you have to, at a minimum, get people employed <laughs> out of the... Okay, out, minimum out, out, yeah. number. So <laughs> let's at least start with <laughs> making sure that the... And this is very important for the financial incentives. If you're mm-hmm. trying to work with a training organization that is incentivized on how many people they get trained. Dropout rates might not matter. You just pad the programs a bit. You know, your placement rates don't matter. You have to have the financial incentives oriented toward placements, toward actually getting jobs. With the concept of the integrators, everyone in that value chain needs to have that incentive. Everyone from the very beginning needs to have the incentive of having them in a job, not just handing them off to the next Mm. stage. I think we also discussed before where meaning is 
beginning to play a bigger part. So oh, yeah. unlike our time where it's just, oh, we need to survive, we need to put food on the table, we just take whatever job that yep. comes. Yep. But nowadays, people want to look at meaning, they want to look at purpose, purpose, and that will help to ensure the longevity of their career there. Yeah. I'm also curious to hear from you, since you've been doing this for quite some time, what's the most interesting and memorable career enablement story that you have? Oh my gosh, there's so many. So we have been serving neurodivergent populations recently. So we have a, a fairly big program. I think we've done over 100 in Hong Kong. I think we've done about 50 or so in Australia. And we're going to start working in Singapore. There's two groups. We have special education needs. So people who are intellectually challenged and have other developmental problems. Uh, we've put into customer service roles. And then we have for slightly higher functioning autistic spectrum, ADHD. Uh, we're putting them into quality assurance tester roles. Every one of those is emotional because the, the counterfactual on those is, is pretty sad. It's incredibly difficult for a lot of people, uh, even basic autism, to get in and, and stick in a typical job. Taking someone whose prospects are quite dire and putting them, really mainstreaming them into a company, into a really strong role. We have someone that we put into a QA tester role in Hong Kong who quite quickly was promoted into a supervisory role who came back and hired another neurodivergent person from the program. And that just, I get goosebumps when I talk oh, about wow. that. It's, it, I mean, that is That's just lovely. beyond life-changing. The little cafe downstairs on the third floor hires neurodivergent. Mm. It's always wonderful to see like how valuable that is. They are a little bit slower and they take a bit of time to process information, but everyone knows that this is worth doing. So yeah. they're patient. Yeah. And then go slow. And there's a lot of strengths in there, too. If you've met someone on the autistic spectrum, you've met one person on the autistic spectrum, right? I mean, that's such a wide oh, variety of, of what you're going to get. But there are some strengths. There's a lot of neurodivergent autistic have a lot of focus. ADHD have a lot of focus. So there are some roles that they're actually can Pretty be good. quite good at. That's why we chose a quality assurance tester. It's a technical mm. role. It's a little bit of a repetitive role. So not everybody loves to do it. But for some people on the spectrum, it just fits their personality very well. Yeah. Mm. That's great. Yeah. Okay, now we can ask some personal questions. <laughs> so I want to ask you, what is your idea of a good career? For me, a tremendous amount is work-life balance. I've tried very successfully, fortunately. And again, I've been lucky to be able to do so, to be able to balance work and career. And I, I started in McKinsey and for you know early days McKinsey of McKinsey. McKinsey cannot have tough. been nope. a place where nope. there's work life balance. Nope. I don't nope. believe you if you tell nope. me. Nope. nope. I did not say I that. I think that if you say the word work life balance in office, McKinsey. you'll be fired. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A bit tricky. Actually McKinsey is, is a, a great place it really to work. was a wonderful yeah. company. I haven't been inside McKinsey for a while, but I still work with them. The culture of McKinsey is quite good. It is not kind of dog eat dog mm. as it's made out to be. Everyone is super competitive, but if you do well, that doesn't mean someone else doesn't do well. Right. So it's actually a really great and you know quick growth environment, but it is incredibly intense. It's incredibly mm. intense because you are serving clients and clients you know, want you to do 10 things when you sure. only have time to do five. So no, work-life balance did not come from there. I think that was uh, an early wake-up call that work-life balance is going to have to be important. But then a lot of the rest of what I've done has been trying to f do things that I enjoy, that mm. I think are fun and and with people that I want to work with mm. that allow me to work in the way that I want to, to have the quiet times when I need the quiet times. Right. I, I work very well kind of in bursts, right? I'm not very good at, at kind of going kind of long and slow. And so being able to build my jobs and my career around that has been helpful. I mean, I need to be doing something meaningful as well. I mean, I was, my last 10 years or so of consulting, a lot of it was for uh, cosmetics companies and <laughs> hotels and <laughs> things like that. Corporations you know. with a deep pocket. Yeah, yeah, which is great when you're consulting and fun projects and good companies, uh, working with people with good hearts. But, you know, at the end of the day, I don't want to be selling lipstick. And that's why I kind of threw myself into Generation. It was founded by McKinsey, actually. It's founded by a friend of mine who started McKinsey about the same time, uh, Mona. And I saw that this was starting to grow up a few years ago. And I just called her when I was wrapping up one of my clients. And I'm like, give it to me. I want to do this. I want to grow this up in Asia. I need to get back to helping people. I did, used to do a lot of healthcare work. I worked with right. hospitals and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that that is really important to me. And doing it in a way that allows me to give it like all my best energy. I can't give it all my best energy if I don't have some control of my work life. So if you were talking to a 25-year-old on the first job, mm. struggling, because everything is new, everything is fast, and yeah. a lot is demanded of them. What would you say? There is a small aspect of you just have to put in a few hard yards. You do. Before you build the credibility, before you really have the experience, 
you're going to have to put in a bit of effort. I don't think anyone should pretend that they can go into their first job very inexperienced and dictate how they're going to work every day. Right. I mean, I think you need to set boundaries. I think you need to have a, a point of view about it. I think you earn the right to do that over time. Um, to, to be very frank, you do earn the right to Amen. do that over time. And I think much as the listeners and all of us would appreciate how useful and interesting JSIT would be, I would imagine many people would still much prefer their career pivots to be a bit less hmm. turbulent and be yeah. a bit more smoother. Yeah. So for the mid-career people out there, a typical 40-year-old who have mortgages to pay, yeah. kids to finance, what are some of your tips and advice for them to help them ensure that they are sharp, they are at a good maintenance mode yeah. and to take preventive measures so that they yeah. can always be relevant to the workforce. I, I think that's it exactly. There's so much asynchronous content out there, relatively inexpensive content, LinkedIn Learn. There's just so much out there that's accessible. It's the company's responsibility. It's an individual's responsibility to know where their individual job is going, where the technology is going, and upskill themselves. And Singapore is fantastic for this. It has great subsidies for training programs. Just that there's so much out there that is accessible. Now, if you're a 40-something, still in a job, you do have a bit of the luxury to do the research and kind of figure out what it is that you want to go do and you know where to get the training. So I think you have an ability to do that, but I think they need to be a bit proactive about finding the training and getting themselves upskilled so they can just maintain themselves in that yeah. role or so they can yeah, move so on to the next stage. On. So the people that are taking that extra step to keep themselves relevant are the ones that are going to succeed longer term. But less complaining, more action. Yeah, yeah, that's always a good thing. Thanks, Jeremy. What I took away from this discussion is that things will always change. The world we live in is changing at breakneck speed. Mm -hmm. And... The things we study for today is not going to be applicable tomorrow. And I think that's going to be a fact, right? Which, of course, makes us confront what we want in our career. And to get what we want, we need to be very clear about what's out there yeah. and to go get it. And I think nowadays it's really more obvious than ever that there is no more iron rice boat. There's no long life mm. employment mm. and yep, things yep. just keep changing so fast that you cannot be dependent on your company, on someone else, on the government mm. to help, always help move you forward. Yep. You have to take ownership of it. You don't really have to spend a lot of time, maybe, I don't know, 30 minutes a week or even a month. Just think about your career, where you are, listen to some podcasts, subscribe to some <laughs> newsletter, just learn some new yep. skills skills as Jeremy mentioned go to yep. LinkedIn Learning there's so much free content out there it's just trying to be a bit more discerning and take that action so instead of spending another 30 minutes on Netflix maybe <laughs> just spend 10 minutes on a YouTube video that teaches you something that might be useful okay but I can't give up on my Netflix sorry <laughs> and my Disney Plus it's all about balance yeah, I hope our discussion has been useful we welcome your views and ideas on work and career the team behind this podcast is Jacqueline Chan Joanne Chan Saya Wynn and I'm Crispina Robert and I'm Adrian signing off 